Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. Let's join Pastor Paul Carlson for today's message. You know, it's funny, in, in this particular series, we've called it True Colors, and it's, it's turned out to be verse by verse going through James 1. And in, in really, in all honesty, when we began this series, I didn't intend to do that. I was really just reading James 1. I read in the Message Bible, and I caught this one phrase that I said, that's a message. And I told Pastor Stephen, and he made a, a slide for it, but it ended up being a series. So whatever, how do you do that? So today we're kind of finishing it by uh, reading the last couple verses in this chapter. And I'm going to do that, and I want to just give a, a quick review because I do believe this is the last of that series. And uh, we'll start fresh with something after the OCC day. And uh, praise the Lord. I'll, I could tell you what that is, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Keeping that cat in the bag. You know, the trouble when you let the cat out of the bag, it's hard to get him back in. So, <laughs> James 1.26, it says this, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. And I'd say, ow, I don't want that to happen. Pure religion undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So in the past, I heard it was nine weeks. What we've done is we've gone through this first chapter of James, and we've talked about this consistently is, is, is staying true to ourselves. Staying true, let me say it this way, staying true to our real self. Staying true to the person on the inside. Staying true to who God made us to be. And, and being the same you know, on a good day and a bad. What is a bad day? Do we really ever have bad days? Put it this way, we're confronted with bad things on certain days. You know, you know Mark had one a couple weeks ago that, that almost made him negative again, and that would have been terrible. But he, he snapped out of it. He realized, he says, no, I'm going to be the real Mark. I'm standing up on the inside no matter what's trying to come against me. And I put down negativity. I'm going to live life and enjoy life and praise the Lord. And, and, and so... Through this series, we've talked about, we've talked about not being double-minded. Do you remember that? Yeah. Not being double-minded. So, you know, what I'd tell you is this, that in life, this is my goal, this is my quest, that I'm going to be more aware of God and what he's telling me in, in, than any other situation, than any other person. That's being single-minded. That's putting my mind on him. And, and, and uh, you know, let me back up and say this, too. This is how reviews go. I'm trying to think of everything I want to say to you before I close the book. Uh, in, in all that we've talked about, you know, don't let God's word, don't let principles of God's word become a formula. That's degrading. It's degrading the power and it's, it's, it's taking something that God gave us and not using it the way he intended it. When we reduce his word, when we, do, we reduce faith to a formula, what we're doing is really we're trying to do it without his help. Okay? And, and the, the way that God creates things and the way he sets things up is this. It, it, he always causes us to be dependent on him isn't that something have you noticed that you know you know I, I I get off and I think well I've got it all together I know how it works and I get off and I forget him and I fall on my face okay because you know no matter how much you seem to have it together you're not together without him it always is going to go back to relationship and so we're not giving you a formula. You could listen to the, the series here that I taught. And, you know, in it, you know, I gave a bunch of points that James did here. And the truth is, he's just telling you to, to live out of your heart. And beware, because there's traps out there. There's things you could fall into that, that cause you to act differently than what God wants you to for, for success. Okay? Um, so let me get back to this. What he also said is, is don't be a hypocrite, okay? You know what a hypocrite is? Nobody here knows, right? 
A hypocrite is someone who lives one way in one place and lives another way in another place, okay? It could be like this. You come to church and you have one, you know, your game face on, and then, you know, you're in Walmart or something. Why do I always find myself in Walmart? Uh, uh, yeah, anyway. I'm at the Mall of America. And, and anyway, and... and uh, you run into somebody, and you're acting different than you do in church. You ought to be the same wherever you're at, you know? Uh, you know, and, and more, more often it happens like this, that you're with one group of people, and you might act one way, and then you're with another group, and you act another way. That's hypocrite. Hypocrite. And, and we've probably all done that. I won't ask for any hands. But, but if you haven't been that way, then, then you haven't lived through high school yet, <laughs> okay? Because everybody's done it, okay? But we're not, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We don't want to think one way one place or with some person and then think and act another way with another one. I, uh, uh, one of a preacher that I know uh, grew up, he's, uh, he's, well, was Mark Hankins, I'll just tell you. Anybody know who Mark Hankins is? He's a good preacher, and he... Uh, he grew up as a, as a preacher's kid. And, uh, you know, God bless preacher's kids. Because there's a pressure that gets on them to act sometimes different than, than you know, who they feel like they are. Okay? And, and the thing is, is with, with preacher's kids, with any kid, what's really important is you have your own relationship with God. That you're not who you are because of who your parents are. You're not who you are because of who anybody else is except for who God is in your life. And, and so anyway, Mark grew up as a preacher's kid, and he tells a story of, of um, being in church. He was kind of a rebellious kid growing up in the teen years, and he's in church one Sunday, and, and uh, lo and behold, his worst nightmare manifested before him. What was that, you say? Well, he's sitting there, and one of his friends from school came to his church where his parents are the pastors. And, and Mark's like, oh, my, you know? And he goes, and he finds this person, and he, he, he sits by him. He says, well, I've never seen you here before. Well, no, it's the first time here. It seems like a good place, you know, the guy's saying. And Mark, under his breath, what he, continue, what he does from this point is he prays, Oh, Lord, have mercy. Please don't let it be a wild service. This is what he prays be, for the sake of his friend, of course, right? But, um, well, you know what? I, I've been in the, that same situation, and, and uh, it, it ended up that somebody did something that triggered another person to do something else, and before you knew it, his mom in the front row is going, Woo! 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 And the next thing you know, his mom just, just drops everything and starts running laps around the church counterclockwise. I don't know. Maybe it was clockwise. I don't know. But anyway, running around the church, and, and so Mark's sitting there with his friend from school, and his friend looks at him and says, wow, who's that? And Mark looks at his, fr his friend and says, I, I, I've never seen that lady before. <laughs> he says, we get all kinds in this place. <laughs> now, I'm sorry, Mark, if you're listening. I didn't mean to put you down, but in this case, that was being a hypocrite. And I'll, I'll tell you this, because I've done that kind of stuff, okay? I've done that growing up. You know, I was embarrassed. You know, I really didn't get born again until I was, was 20. But uh, as a kid, my parents would take me to church, and I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue, and, and it embarrassed me. And it would have been my nightmare, too, you know, to have people from, from my school come in and, oh, oh, this is who you are. You know, I would have been identified. I would have been branded. That's how I would have felt. I, it's, it's so cool, well, for me to even get saved and then to grow up, because now I love it, you know? I love, I, I want people that I used to know to come to church. I want them to come to this church if they can, you know? And, and I had a friend come like uh, a year ago. You say, you have a friend, Pastor? Well, yeah, I do. I had this guy that I've known for, you know, an embarrassingly long time. Since we were kids in grade school, we lived near each other, and he showed up in church here like last summer. 
and uh, and uh, it was it was the greatest thing to me. I had him sit, you know, by Dana while I was preaching, and you know, and and he 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 called me up a few. He's been saying he's going to come back, and it's like I'm like, yeah, come on, because I want you around. You see, James is telling us. He says in life. Don't be double-minded. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be somebody different dependent on the group you're in. He went on again. He said this. He says, don't, don't blame God. Don't fall into this trap when, when something bad is happening. Don't take it for an occasion to blame God for something in your life. Now, if you've done that, man, God loves you, and there's hope for you, but that is a trap that's laid out there to keep you from rising up. Okay, and, and, and we talked about that. We talked also about, what else did we talk about? But hearing from heaven, you know, really that's a, that's a key in life as you're, as you're going through life day to day is, is to hear heaven, hear heaven. You see, your Christianity, you know, there's things about it, you know, this is the same as everybody else. You could say it's a stamp, you know, you're, you're righteous and you're holy before God and all these things. But I'm telling you, your life as a Christian is not some kind of a carbon copy. I'm telling you, it's happening as you go. And, and, and you can't just have everything in a box and think this is the way it's going to be. You've got to hear heaven. I, I, I'll say this, I was having coffee with someone this week, and I and, uh, won't mention the name, but they, they uh, are someone who, who has kids, and, and they, they said this to me, they said, you know, if one of my kids is, is being struck with sickness, he said, the first thing I do is pray and ask God, what should I do? Should I take him to the doctor, or should we just believe God right now? And I said, hooray. Hooray, that's right. Don't think every trial that you have, don't think, even if you've gone through the similar circumstances before, don't think that you've got it all figured out how it's going to turn out. I'm telling you, man, God might have you going to a doctor and believe in God all the way and, 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 and just seeing great things happen through it. Or he might say, hey, stand on the word right now. But don't cut heaven off from you and think that some formula is going to change your life. Hey, it's all right. Just throwing it out there. And I haven't even really started yet. Is there a Packer game today? No, anyway, praise the Lord, hey. All right, so then we said you need to hear heaven. And then what we said, too, is then you need to do what heaven's telling you. Okay? Very important. In, in life, you'll succeed when you hear heaven and do what heaven is telling you. It doesn't work for your neighbor to hear heaven and then you try to do what God told them to do. No, you need to hear yourself. It would be like someone asking someone to go to the bathroom for you. Think about that. It's never worked, never worked in our house. And, and it won't work in yours either. You need to hear heaven yourself. All right, getting down to the topic today, and this is what it is, is your words, your words need to reflect what heaven is saying to you, okay? Your words, your words have impact in this world. Your words have impact in your life. And if we're going to rise up, if we're going to be the people that God has called us to be, one thing we need to do is get a hold of our tongues. In James 1, the scripture that I read, he said this. He says that we actually need to bridle our tongues. What that means is that you've got to make your tongue obey you. You can't just let it go wild and say anything it wants to say. And sometimes my tongue wants to say things that aren't good. Can I take it a little further? Okay. Now, it, it probably doesn't need to, be, need to be said that, you know, we don't want to be talking bad about other people. But what I'm going to tell you today is you don't want to be talking bad about you. Okay. We want to rise up in life. We want to be more than conquerors. The Bible calls us. One thing we got to do is learn to speak like God speaks about us. When you look in the mirror in the morning, when you're going through a situation in life, 
don't turn the table on God and don't turn it on you. In the, in, in, in what I mean by that is don't start talking bad about who you are. Now in Luke 6, 45, stay with me. It says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For, this is a clincher of it here, it says, for out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So I'm going to give you a paraphrase of that. Hang around with God so that the biggest sound or the biggest voice you're hearing is his and then go say what he says. Okay? Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. Where I've seen people get tripped up is they, they come around, you know, this kind of stuff, and they, again, they make it a formula. They hear someone say, you know, my God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, and they say that 50 times and think, well, that's going to bring the answer. No, but taking the time and spending with God, talking to him. You know what's a really cool thing to do is just take the word and talk with God about it. Talk with him about his word. Talk to him. Have, have a conversation with him about what he says to you. You know, saying what God says about you, I'm telling you, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. You know, and maybe you're at a point where it just seems like it doesn't even seem real well. Then you got to start saying what God says about you. Start finding out in the Bible what God says about you. And declaring it to yourself. I'm telling you, that's, that's great. But take it from there to where you're having fellowship with him. Fellowship with God. And allowing his word to just be in abundance in you. And then come out of your mouth. That's what changes things. Go to Matthew 6, 31. So, wrapping this series up, what we're talking about is this. Hearing from heaven, doing what, what heaven says, and saying what heaven says to you, okay? Do you know what I mean when I say heaven? I'm talking about God. God speaks to you. He delivers messages to you. You guys, have you all heard God before? Has he spoken to you? I mean, maybe I won't have you raise your hand. I'm telling you what, he'll speak into your life. He'll show you things. You know, it might be as simple as the fact that he loves you. It might be as simple as what Mark was talking about when he got born again, you know, back in the day, that he just had this overwhelming peace. That's a message from heaven. That is a message from heaven. And you don't have to be, you know, 40 years old in the Lord, or almost 40 years old in the Lord, to hear heaven. You can be a brand new Christian, and you ought to hear heaven. I'm telling you, the first day, the first night I got born again, I, I'm telling you what, God was speaking to me. He was speaking to me. And what was he telling you? He was saying that he loved me. You say, well, everybody knows that God loves you. That was something that was foreign to my thinking. It was foreign to my, my vocabulary. But it was so real to me that even driving around with my friends the night I got born again, while they're smoking dope, I said, guys, God loves me. And they thought, I must really be high. <laughs> they said, man, you're really out there now. Matthew 6, 31, Jesus said this. He said, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Verse 32 says, for all these things the Gentiles seek, your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. The word Gentiles simply is referring to people that don't know God. Okay? Okay, he, Jesus said this. People that don't know God go around worrying and saying, what am I going to do? What am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? He says, you guys, there ought to be a difference. There ought to be a difference. If you know God, I tell you what, don't go around saying that. That's what Jesus said. Now let me read another verse. In Luke 16, or 17, verse 6, again, Jesus talking, and he said this. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Now, 
what does that verse have to do with the other verse that we read in, in Matthew? Well, one word, and it's the word say. And in one, one verse it said saying. And the word say or the word saying that are used in these verses, you want to know what the Greek word for it is? Yeah. You know, and I don't do a lot of Greek studies and all this, but I, this one was really cool. The Greek word for that is the word lego. Lego my ego. Lego, okay? Lego, you know, and you want to know what the Greek definition for that is? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to tell you what it means to me. What Lego means to me, it brings me back to kindergarten where I'm building things. I'm building planes. I'm building. It brings me to the Mall of America when I'm going up the elevator and I'm looking off over Lego land. And I see what new creations they've made. They've made spaceships and aliens and gorillas and all kinds of things. Anything you can imagine, it seems like they can make it with a Lego. See, a Lego is like a building block. And in this case, it's a building block of your life. And what your life is going to look like is made up of a bunch of Lego. And Jesus said, be careful what you Lego. Don't Lego like people who have no relationship with God, but instead draw into your relationship with God and let your Lego come out of that. Because God wants to make something super cool. Super cool. Where you're running up the escalator at the MOA and you go, whoa, baby, look at the Lego around here. That's what they're going to say to you when, you're, when they're looking at you, man. They're going to say, wow, man, what Legos have done, what God has done through you. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Talking about the power of our words, the power of speaking what God is speaking, the power of having a relationship with him that's so tight, man, he's speaking over your life and you're just declaring what he said. In James chapter 3, verse 5. It says this, it says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. And see how great a forest a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the very course of nature and is set on fire by hell. Wow. Praise the Lord. Now, nobody, don't run right now, okay? Don't go, woo, 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 and run around the room right now, okay? You know, this is really what James is saying. He's saying, guys, let's talk about life. He says, hey, have you ever seen a fire? You ever seen maybe a forest fire? I mean, I, 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 I have it, you know? I, I keep track of the forest fires in California because my aunt lives in Glendale, and sometimes she tells me she can smell the smoke coming into her apartment, and I'm like, oh, you know, we're praying for you, you know, Aunt June. And, and so I watch that, but I've never seen a real one, but I've seen a fire before, and they're, they're devastating. And one thing I've learned over the years is, is even when you're watching a fire blaze, it's very hard to tell how it started. You know, Smokey the Bear, he knows what happens. And, and there's other folk that are trained experts that will go into a place and they can determine how a fire has actually started. You know, they trace it back and they figure it out. Well, James is just saying this. He says, guys, sometimes we've looked at our own lives and they've been ablaze. A they've been set on fire of hell. And he says, let me tell you something. Now, James here is the expert, and he's an expert because the Holy Ghost is speaking through him. And he says this, if we were to trace it back in your life and find what started the fire that looks like hell in your life, it comes back to your words. Letting a tongue go untamed. Now, it goes on here in James, and he talks about he talks about different, you know, animals that can be tamed, but he says the tongue no man can tame. And it almost seems defeatist, you know, to say, wow, you know, you're telling me all this bad stuff can happen by letting my tongue go wild. And, and, and then he tells me that no man can tame the tongue. Oh, oh, I'm just getting depressed. Don't talk anymore, preacher. But let me tell you, the good news is this, is, is no man can tame a tongue, but with God's help, with Holy Spirit working in you and through you, your tongue can be tamed. You can control your tongue by, by the help of the Holy Ghost. You know, I tell you what, life, life is, is, is an adventure. Faith is an adventure. 
You know, and in the beginning of this series, you know, we had a, a few times that we talked about the disciples and some of the training that they went through. And, you know, really the, the, the Gospels are, are a story of how Jesus was taking these 12 guys and, you know, and training them, mentoring them, showing them things. You know, we saw how he tried to get them to, to, to be a part of the miracle when the, the 5,000 were fed and when the 4,000 were fed. And, and, you know, it wasn't just that Jesus wanted to, to do this miracle, but he wanted to use the guys. But they weren't quite ready to be used at that level. And then we saw Peter, you know, when, when Jesus was walking on the water. And, and Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And what happened is while he's walking on the water, he, he began to sink. And that's crazy in itself. How can you begin to sink? You just sink. I'm good at it. You know, jump in the pool, right down. But Peter, he began to sink. Have any of you ever began to sink? We all have. If you haven't, you've never gotten out of the boat. But Jesus... Jesus is so merciful and so kind when we begin to sink. He doesn't make fun of us. You know, he reaches out his hand and pulls us up. And if you've been like Peter and you've been out on the water and, and trying to water walk and you began to sink, well, do you know what you do when it's all over? You need to get in the boat and you need to dry off. And you need to go on to the next faith adventure. Because if you look at the life of, just say, Peter, for example, he had some faith disasters. But you read over in the book of Acts, and I'm telling you what, he got some stuff down. He's the first one we saw preaching to a crowd, having 3,000 people get born again in one sermon. God using him, speaking through him. He's the one that they talk about in Acts chapter 5 where it says they line people up in the streets that if even the shadow of Peter might touch them, they'd, they'd get healed. You know what that tells me? It tells me there's hope for you and me. We need to shake it off and go on. I'm going to read you one verse in Proverbs. And then we'll finish up in James. In Proverbs 16, 23, it says this. It says, the heart of the wise will teach his mouth and add learning to his lips. In line with what we're talking about today is, is, you know, don't take a bunch of condemnation. Don't feel like you're a failure. But say this, say, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to learn to teach my mouth. Wherever I'm at, I'm going to start to saying what God says to me. I'm going to find out from his word what he says to me. I'm going to listen to heaven. And what heaven's saying, I'm going to say it too. I'm going to teach my mouth. My mouth's not going to be rebellious. No, I'm going to say what God says. Because it'll change things in our life. Turning back to James, and we'll end with this. In James 1, you know, we've, we've, again, we've walked through this chapter. And he, 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 what we were just talking about is, is you know, if we, anyone thinks they're religious, he says they need to bridle their tongue. Otherwise, they can be deceived. Their own heart can be deceived. And then their religion is use, useless. But in verse 27, I'll just read this. It says, But pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. How many want to do that? Well, next Sunday at 1030, we're going to be here in this place and we're going to be packing these boxes up for the orphans in the world. And you know the cool thing is, is you don't even have to leave this building and you can go anywhere in the world and touch an orphan. Amen? Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. To partner with this ministry or for any additional information, please visit libertychristiancenter.org.